Welcome back to our series of lectures on the birth of historical linguistics and the discovery of Indo-European language. Pictured here again in this picture is the uh, steppes of uh, Kazakhstan, where, um, which is in the, roughly in the region of, of central Western Asia, the steppes of Asia, the grassy, hilly area, the river, they call it a sea of grass that runs between China and Hungary. Um, and this is where the Indo-European peoples, as so many other peoples, are believed to have originated. Some have called it the birthplace of nations. So this is an Indo-European supplemental lecture, and our topic in this lecture, which is kind of a sidebar, and it's meant to assist you particularly in your reading of Van Geldering and your, on, your reading of other uh, uh, more technical um, uh, sources going forward, our topic here is... What is inflectional morphology? Now, some of you, uh, if you've studied Latin or German or um, Russian or various other languages, have um, encountered, uh, even Spanish and French have a richer inflectional system than modern English does. Um, but one of the things that you need to understand about this class, and I, want, is, and I mean this is as encouragement, is that the difficulty conceptually is front-loaded. The first two or three weeks are going to be the hardest. Thinking about language in a structural, systematic way, and then using it to look at Old English, which is a more heavily inflected, um, difficult language for a modern English language to uh, learn, language, modern English language speaker to learn, is going to be one of the hardest things that you do all, all year. And after that, we're going to get more into cultural issues and more sort of small ball. It's going to get easier, especially with this foundation under you. So with that said, let's begin to talk about what inflectional morphology is and what were the things that William Jones was looking at when he was using his comparative method. Now to start out with, I'm going to tell you about how linguists organize or categorize the languages of the world. And this is an organizational scheme that doesn't have to do with their descent or their relationship to each other. We're not talking about language families like Indo-European or Semitic or, or you know, Algonquin. We're talking about structural categories of how languages are structured. And that there's three basic types, isolating, and this includes Mandarin, agglutinative, such as Japanese, Bantu, and Algonquian, and inflectional, in which case markers on nominals indicate their grammatical relationships to other words in the sentence and mark gender and number agreement among words in phrases. Let's take a closer look at that again. Um, analytical or isolated languages like Mandarin, um, all morphemes are separate words. And what is a morpheme? A morpheme is a fundamental building block of a word. And in English, we can combine different morphemes together. So, for example, walk is a morpheme. And it is a, considered a free morpheme because it can exist on its own and have meaning. So I walk to the store. Then we can add other morphemes in front of it, like uh, id, id at the end, like walked. And now uh, that morpheme at the end indicates pastness, but that id at the end is a bound morpheme. In analytical languages, pure isolating languages like Mandarin, all morphemes are free morphemes. You don't connect them in the same word. All morphemes are separate words, and therefore meaning is determined entirely by word order and by the addition of different morphemes. So if you want to say, I, I walked to the store in Mandarin, you would say something like, I walk, and then a word that means past um, to the store, right? Um, I don't know much about Mandarin, but that's my understanding. And then there's agglutinative languages. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but agglutinative languages combine different morphemes, but all the morphemes stay the same. And there's usually only one grammatical category per affix. So what that means is that if I have a, like a, a place to attach a, an, a morpheme after a morpheme per walk, then the position right after it will always be for tense. The position right after that will always be for mood or so on and so forth. Um, but don't worry about this too much. Our chief concern here right now is to understand synthetic, inflectional, or fusional languages 
Now, fusional can include both agglutinative and, or synthetic can uh, include both agglutinative or fusional, but that's a more recent thing. But really, inflectional is the term that we're looking for here, or synthetic. Um, and in these languages, nouns and adjectives are changed by stem changes and or affix to indicate their case, gender, and number. So a noun and an adjective changes depending on its case, gender, and number. And we're going to explain what case is. But basically, it's like the difference between subject or object or possessive. It's the role that a noun is playing in the sentence. Um, and when I say stem change or affix, we can talk about, um, you know, penny, right? That's a noun. I've got a box. I've got one penny. I've got a box full of pennies. So an uh, affix is a prefix or a suffix. In this case, the letter S, which goes to the end of pennies, right? But in a, the, it can also change from a stem, stem change. So one man, it's not necessarily multiple mans. It can be multiple men, right? So this is a stem change. This indicates a change in number. Adjectives in more inflected nouns agree with nouns, sorry about the typo, to build nominal phrases. And we're going to, um, and verbs have, are altered by stem changes and or affixes to indicate tense, mood, aspect, number, and person. Or I'm going to explain all this. First of all, what is a noun? An adjective case. An inflection or a sound change that indicates function in a sentence. In the English pronoun has three cases, uh, right? We have he, she, we, they. That is the subject case. We don't say him throws the ball. We say he throws the ball. We have to say he throws the ball. Out if we're native speakers of English, our brains just know to do that automatically. Him, her, us, them is the object case, right? We, we can't say I see he or I see she or as native speakers will know that's not right. You say him, her, us, them. That's the object case. And then we have a possessive, right? I saw he ball. No, I saw his ball, right? His, her, their, and so on and so forth. Adjectives in more, in, in, in languages that are more richly inflected than English, adjectives agree with the nouns they modify. In modern Romance languages such as Spanish, we'll say, you know, of the, um, the fair-haired lord, of the blonde lord, del doño rubio, de los doños rubios. Notice that the adjective rubio has changed in, uh, to modify doños. Now this feature of adjectives being inflected to match or agree with their nouns drops out of English in the Middle Ages, and we'll talk about that later. But it doesn't drop out of Spanish, doesn't drop out of uh, French, doesn't drop out of German, doesn't drop out of a lot of European languages. English has undergone a greater degree of inflection loss than most other Indo-European languages, for reasons we'll discuss in this class. But Spanish has undergone a certain amount of inflection loss relative to its direct ancestor, Latin. In Latin, let's look at fair-haired lord, dominus albus, or fair-haired lady. Domina alba, fair lady. Um, by the way, that albus for fair is cognate with the word elf, um, and it means light or fair skin, so that's where albus Dumbledore comes from. Now, if you want to say of the fair-haired lord, you say domini albi. Of the fair-haired lords, dominorum alborum, a domini albi, the fair ladies, dominarum albarum, of the fair ladies. So we can see how that possessive, which has been turned into a preposition in Spanish, is still indicated by a different ending in Latin. This is because Spanish doesn't have case noun cases. It has um, prepositions to indicate function in a sentence, just like in English. But the farther we go back in Indo-European history, the more, the less work prepositions do, and the more work that noun cases do. In Indo-European, we had, every noun had eight cases, one for subjecthood, objecthood, direction towards, dislocation from, 
temporality that is when, like I did it in the summer you wouldn't say in the summer you would have an ending on summer indicating that summer was referring to time and not I like summer or summer is coming exchange that is giving taking to or giving from possession we hang on to that in our pronouns agency it was done by that person you wouldn't say by that you would just say person with the ending indicating agency and instrumentation i did it with a shovel right and you would say shovel and then you would add that ending so every noun not just pronouns but nouns have all of these cases in indo-european and i think russian still preserves like seven or eight cases uh hindi has five romanian has three i think um four nouns not just for pronouns um we also have case endings that are differ for number and gender. So for a single noun, you might get, you know, multiply this by this by this, and that will tell you how many different kinds of forms of a single noun there could potentially be. You see now why Dante thought that Latin was more complicated than uh, Italian and why there's no way that that could have naturally come before, because how could you... You know, how could you build, take something that's complicated and reduce it to something simpler? We know now that inflection loss is common, um, especially when language, uh, languages are in contact with other languages. Because um, one of the things about heavily inflected languages is that they're easier for children to learn, but they're harder for adults to learn. So the longer um, a language is isolated from many others, the more it's likely to become increasingly fusional, increasingly synthetic. And the more that it's in contact with other languages, the more that it likely it is to reduce all of these endings and become more analytic, more like Chinese, more like modern English. And as we'll see in this class, English has been in a great deal of contact with other languages. So that's nouns, and I'm using the word nominals here as a word that describes both nouns and adjectives because they can both work as nouns, right? You can say, I like black, right? And, and black is, is, can be both an adjective and a noun. These things can sort of uh, um, uh, be substituted for one another. Oh, yeah, and just one little quirk about um, old Eng um, Indo-European. There was a number for single and plural, but also dual. So you might have a particular case ending that indicates two of something. So, you know, we say we have a single, a singular, you know, penny, a plural, pennies. What if we had said pennio to indicate two pennies? Isn't that weird? Um, Latin holds on to this in, in earlier Latin texts, especially. And Old English still has a dual case as well. Um, verbs. Now, the, ver the Indo-European uh, verbs inflected for these five features voice, that is the role of the subject, and that talks about active or passive, or in Greek there's a middle voice, which is too weird to describe. Basically, is it is the thing doing the thing, or is it happening to the thing, right? Um, tense, when it's happening, an aspect is also about time. So if tense says when, aspect says how long, how frequently, right? It talks about whether... Um, uh, you know, I, you know, if so, if I say I walked versus I was walking or I used to walk, these are all past tense, but they're all different aspects. Um, mood indicates this is hard to describe, but it's a degree of reality or it's the relationship of the verb to reality. So an indicative says this is happening, imperative, make it happen, optative, I hope it happens. And the subjunctive is the weird one because this is a structural designation. It's used in various ways in various languages, but it basically is the mood of a verb that you use in relative clauses. So, and it can be, so I wish that it would happen. I dreamt that it happened. He says that it happens. All of these are things that might in various languages use a subjunctive mood that indicate that something isn't quite necessarily really happening. Person and number, these are the are the easiest thing to understand. You know, I, you, they, singular, plural, and also, of course, dual. Um, so these are the different uh, features that a verb can be inflected for. 
And Latin has a complicated inflection system that is much closer to Indo-European than modern English. So let's look at their verb for to, for love. I love, to love, I loved, I'm modest. These are the four principal parts of the Latin verb. The English has, modern English has three principal parts, as in see, saw, seen, right? And you can, and you can form, basically the principal parts of a verb are those that you need to form every possible form of a verb, every conjugation. That is, every way that you can inflect a verb to indicate, you know, person, voice, speaker, number, and um, the other thing. So let's look at the active imperfect past of the Latin verb. If you want to say, you know, I love, you love, amo, amas, amat, amamos, amatas, amant. But there's so many other things that you could do with the verb. I used to love or I was loving. You add um, ab, ama, bam, and this, these bam, bas, bat endings are common imperfect endings in Latin. Ama, bam, I was loving. Ama, bas, you were loving. Ama, bat, he was loving. Ama, bamos, we were loving. Ama, batas, y'all were loving. Is the plural second person, which in English we don't have, um, except in colloquial English. Ama, bat, they were loving. Okay, so far so good. But guess what? We have also endings for passive verbs, whereas in English we have to use these, these workaround constructions, I was being loved, where we combine all these different words. You see how it's moving more towards the, the analytic or the isolating end of the spectrum? In Latin, we have a whole separate set of endings. Amabar, amabaris, amabator. I was being loved. You were being loved. She was being loved. Amama, amabamor, amabamini, amabantor. Say amabamini, amabamini, sometimes fast. Anyway, um, so that's the Latin verb system. And then you can do all of this in the subjunctive. If you were to say, you know, I was hoped, I hoped that I might have been loved, then you have to change ama to ame, and you repeat the whole thing. Ame bam, ame bas, ame bat. And you can see Dante saying, nobody could have just come up with this naturally. This had to be invented by a bunch of weirdos. Obviously, Italian was the real original language, and then some fancy pants scholars invented Latin. Dante was precisely wrong. Um, uh, Indo as we go farther back in the history of Indo-European languages, inflectional system gets richer and more complicated. And this is what William Jones is talking about when he says he finds Sanskrit to be um, richer, more complete, more abundant, more copious than Greek or Latin, because it's actually an older language than Greek or Latin and closer to Indo-European. Some theorized that Sanskrit itself might have been Proto-Indo-European, but that, that turned out not to be true for various reasons that are too technical for this class. So coming back to comparing those inflectional systems, we can see how using the comparative method and looking at the different um, versions in older languages, we see what's in common. And using those different kind, um, um, diff using those what's in common, scholars, philologists, historical linguists of the 19th century reconstructed earlier versions of the ancestor languages um, using using what you know uh, the comparative method. And we'll talk more about that. Um, but just a, one more thing about morphology while we're on the, the side, while we're on the subject. I talked about bound morphemes before, right? Morphemes that can't exist on their own. They have to be attached to another word. And there's two kinds. One are inflectional morphemes. And these are morphemes that change function, but not part of speech, right? So if I put D, S, or T as in I walked, he walks, I sleep, I slept on these. These they, they do not change a verb into something else. It's still a verb, but it's changing how that verb is functioning. It's giving us more information about what work that verb is doing. This includes stem changes uh, that we find in strong verbs, about which more later, like sleep and drink. But basically, strong verbs, unlike weak verbs, are verbs that change their stem. It's not I drinked, it's I drank, right? And so in English, we have strong verbs and weak verbs. This is a feature of Germanic languages, as we shall see. Um, the other type of bound morpheme are derivational morphemes. 
And these are morphemes that change parts of speech. So we have, for example, ER, which can turn a verb into a noun. A st I slap him, I am a slapper. Um, e turns verbs and nouns into adjectives. So you have lots of luck, you are lucky. You have lots, this surface is oil, it is, it is oily, right? This turns things into adjectives. And then we turns adjectives into adverbs. So quiet becomes quietly. These are derivational morphemes. They take one word, they take a word and they turn it into a different part of speech. Can you think of other derivational morphemes? Um, English has lots of them because it's been collecting them from other languages for the last 1,500 years. All right, uh, so that's it for our discussion of inflectional morphology. Just to conclude with a definition of morphology in linguistics, morphology is the study of words, how they are formed, and their relationship to other words in the same language. It analyzes the structure of words and parts of words, such as stems, root words, prefixes, and suffixes. And in this first part of this course, um, understanding Indo-European and the emergence of Old English from Proto-Germanic, from Indo-European, uh, it's important to understand what, we're to, what we talk about when we talk about morphology. So, the more you know. See you, ne see you next time.